Is it okay without a mic? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'm honored to be uh, presenting to you on uh, this topic. It's the uh, probably the evolution of the research uh, in you know 32 years of, uh, of academic career. So when I started, um, a lot of timber connections were. Uh, in distress in some of the structures that I was exposed to. I saw a lot of brittle failures and uh, the design codes did not, were not good enough to predict what, how these were, uh, these occurred. So did a lot of research from this and to the point where I was able to predict the brittle resistances uh, and being able to predict means that you can avoid it. Uh, from Christchurch, the issue of resilience in timber structure is you know, surfaced, and from that, uh, a new direction was given to, to the research. So today is on resilience of timber structures, looking at the connection ductility and some of the issues that we have to, to deal with. So I'll start with, you know, bit of background, uh, some of the issues, the alternatives that are available to us, and then summarize. So we know that for timber, it's a brittle material at best. Okay, so we'll have uh, brittle failure in tension, in compression. There will be some yielding of some of the fibers, but that's not to be used so much. Uh, and regardless of the direction of loading, okay, along the grain or perpendicular to the grain, resistance are different, but the behavior is more or less the same. Same thing for shear. So we'll get, uh, we'll get a real failure you know, in shear. And we see this in beams where we have tension failures, tension parallel to grain. Uh, some okay, overlook tension or net tension in connection designs and you get you know, very serious tension failures where screws collapse. Okay. You get tension perp to grain, very prominent in Europe, where they use a lot of uh, one big steel plate that restricts the movement once they put all these fasteners in. The wood has no where to go. It wants to shrink under normal dry surface conditions and they get, okay, it's a missing slip. That structure is one year old, okay, so one year old in Germany. So not a good look. And you get compression perpendicular to grain. Okay, obviously not a good design. It was meant to be, it was designed as uh, supposed to be oak, okay, very dense hardwood. Uh, somebody used softwood, not strong enough. Okay, and the perpendicular force in, from the cables gave, gave that issue. So uh, maybe a lot of ductility, but <coughs> problem with strength. So to provide, to provide the ductility in our structure, we need to get it into the connection. Okay? It's not going to be present in the members. And that's not a problem. Okay? If we want to design uh, connection in uh, undergoing static loading, it can be done. Okay, so that's 40 millimeter of displacement, and if it could have could have been detailed differently, we could have had even more than 40 millimeter displacement before this split occurred. Okay, so in this instance, the split is a secondary mode of failure. It governed the amount of ductility that was provided to that connection. But the resistance, the resistance was governed by the embedment of the wood and bending of the fastener. And this is possible. People design uh, connections to resist static load with a lot of uh, ductility. So in the case of dowels, Lots of small dowels, knife plates uh, inserted. You'll have very
very nice ductile behavior. Uh, or you could use rivets in this K brace. And if we zoom in, you'll see that there's a gap between the end plate and the end of the timber member so that the connection can work in tension or in compression and will give the rivets will give enough ductility in both uh, tension and compression behavior. And here in New Zealand, we use a lot of nails, okay? And this uh, typical portal frame moment connection, tons of nails uh, to develop the moment capacity between the rafter and the column. So not a problem in terms of amount or providing ductility. And this we can, we can uh, govern the amount of resistance uh, using the European Mill model. Okay. Uh, here I'm only showing the double shear um, uh, model uh, developed by Johansson in 1949. It's going to be in the next uh, version of 1720-3603, okay, and in any of these, okay, the ductility is provided by a combination of either embedment resistance of the fiber and a bending of the fiber, okay, so that's where we get the ductility. Now, the load displacement relationship associated with these failures, okay, are either purely elastoplastic for modes one and two, or will have this type of load slip behavior, okay, for mode three and mode four. So here we have two plastic hinges in the fastener, and in this one we have four plastic hinges. But in this one, the PY would be given by uh, uh, this one, and then we'd be uh, using this, uh, this value. And for mode one and two, okay, the ultimate and the yield will be the same. And this is possible, okay, quite uh, easily uh, demonstrable. So lots of deformation. These are M20 bolts, so as much as about 20, 25 millimeter displacement, okay, and still being able to go on. Uh, and for these 12 millimeter bolts, and in this case it was a steel wood steel connection and a wood steel wood connection, okay, quite a lot of uh, deformation in the bolt itself, meaning that, okay, it is achievable. Now, this ductility in the connection is achievable as long as we can avoid the premature failure of a, of a brittle failure, okay? The premature secondary brittle failure. So I've shown you an example where the split occurred after a large amount of displacement. If you have a brittle failure, and it's premature for modes one and two, your load slip deformation would look like this. You would not be able to attain the yield or the ultimate. And in the other one, uh, if you attain the PY and beyond, then this secondary mode of failure could prevent you from going further on. Okay, so this, at this point, we still do not control exactly when this secondary mode of failure is occurring, okay? That is part of research that is ongoing at this point, but where that delta U is, we don't control this perfectly right now, okay? We're starting to have an idea, but we don't have it, okay? So, premature brittle failure in an assumed ductile connection will result in a low system or overall building ductility. So right now we're stuck with a mu of 1.25. Not that our connections, 
to not have a lot of ductility. We could design a connection with 40 millimeter displacement, okay? But being able to say exactly when the secondary brittle failure in the connection, in the duct valve connection, will occur, okay, prevents us from making sure that all our ductile elements are working together. So overall, our system or our structure will not have a high ductility value until we can control okay, when these secondary failure, secondary brittle failures occur. So these brittle failures, okay, they can be row shear. Okay, so you would get this when you have small end distances, small spacing. You can get group tear, okay, so a larger end distance and spacing, but okay, overall the group is just can't take it, and you get a tension type of failure between the two last bolts. Okay. Or splitting. And in this case, it's a rivet connection which was imposed, which had a, a moment imposed to it. So these are possible, so ductility is possible for static loading. Under cyclic loading, there's an issue. Okay. So as ductility is provided by a combination of fastener yielding and fiber crushing, that will result in a gap. That crushing of the fibers is non-reversible. Okay. So what we're talking is that you have your connection at start, uh, it's connected to a steel plate, let's say, that is connected to your foundation. At first, the member is loaded in tension. There's crushing of the fibers. <coughs> the low deformation will be ductile. You'll get a nice flat type of connection. That member will come down. It's the first cycle. There's a gap. Okay, That gap is present now. The next cycle, that gap will need to be taken overcome first before there is embedment starting and then more crushing of the fibers and then the member the second cycle completes and we are left with a major gap at the end okay. that's why in these connections okay the mode one or mode two in the EYM is not desirable that gap is a major issue. Okay. We don't want this. So we've adapted. Okay, so seismic designs, seismic timber designs, you know, are imposing okay, the slenderness of connectors so that designers use many small fasteners to ensure a minimum of rigidity at each cycle. So you don't through your thickness of your member, not all the fibers have compressed. So you have some bending of the fasteners that will take over. Okay. And if you use this or adhere to this principle, okay, you will get at least some resistance. So, and people have designed uh, connections this way. So another K brace and uh, a lot of small dowels. So these are about eight millimeter in diameter, tight fit, and a lot of displacement at the end of the plates to allow for compression load in the, um, in the diagonal. But the gap or the, um, the compressed fibers will give us that type of load deformation curve. So there's some cyclic loading, there is embedment failure in the fibers, and at every subsequent cycle, this gap okay, has to be taken before uh, most of the fibers become compressed. And, and this is why we have these small fasteners. Without the small fasteners, okay, the low deformation curve would be on the x-axis all the time. And 
we would have you know, uh, quite an unpleasant uh, low deprivation response of the structure. Okay? And this is what will happen okay, to your structure. At the end, lots, if there's too much deformation, your nails will stick out. Okay? So not necessarily the case when you have a bolted connection. But it's not a resilient structure. Okay? After the earthquake, if there's any residual uh, resistance, it's going to be very sloppy in terms of stiffness. So what about the overstrength factor? So we design our uh, ductile elements to have, okay, from um, the fifth percentile uh, strength values that we get. Okay, this is observed in the lab. We then get some safety factors to the results. We get the characteristic value, and then we apply a phi factor or material factor, and we get our design, our ductile design value. And at the other end, we have our brittle element resistance, which is at that end, but it's not necessarily the brittle element in the structure. It is also, or it needs to be also, the brittle failures of the connection. Okay? If your the brittle failure modes of your connections are not far enough from your ductile resistance, okay, you're still going to be, you're still going to have a problem. Okay? So that distance is paramount, and brittle element or brittle failure in the connection needs to be controlled and pushed to the right as much as possible. So some of the recommended uh, overstrength factors for different connections in shear walls, okay, we have 1.65, okay, not too bad. Nailed shear and hold downs in CLP, 1.3. Okay. Dowel connections, wood, steel, wood, 2. Okay, a discrete connection. Not so good if we want to go multi-story. Okay. So this, this is good in our shear wall, so that's why we are able to, sorry, um, to have very uh, high ductility factors for light timber frame construction. We're moving okay, seriously in that type of construction where we have CLP. Okay, so it is quite predictable but not resilient. And if we have discrete connections, okay, we're not there yet. Okay? We still have a very high uh, <coughs> overstrength factor. So the purpose of your PS4, okay, when you go to site, you make sure that your builder cannot substitute a grade 4.4 for a grade 8.8 .8 bolt into your ductile connection. Okay, because that's going to shift the resistance of your ductile element. You haven't changed, it won't change the brittle resistance of your connection. Okay, the bolt will not change the brittle resistance of your ductile resistance, of your ductile connection. But it will change, okay, according to the UYM, the resistance of your ductile failure mode. It's very important that the builder doesn't substitute because he's going to think that grade 8.8 is better than grade 8.4.4. Okay? So it's not good for your ductile connection. So with these, um, with these uh, data, we can say that for uh, male shear walls, we're allowed to go with ductility of 4. As long as the nail connection is the governing mode of failure and that your um, hold down connection can sustain the loads. Okay, and if we have just discrete ductile connections, then we're at 1.25. It's not easy to prevent those brittle failures, okay, before the attainment of large deformation in your ductile connection in your system, in your structure. Okay? So 
where this is function of not necessarily one connection. This is the ensemble of all your ductile connections in your structure. So we have high base shear, high overstrength factors, as high as two, and loss of stiffness in the connections following seismic events. So not a resilient design. So not a good prospect for us who wants to go to mass timber construction, okay? Uh, because shear walls are not used as lateral load resisting systems or panelized shear walls are not used. So the alternatives to us, okay? One of them is the post-engineering post timber, the press lamp system developed at uh, University of Canterbury with uh, Alessandro Alerpo, uh, Stefano Pepinen, and Andy Buchanan. Okay, they wrote a lot on this. Uh, so you have cables going to the foundation, the shear walls are rocking, or your moment connection is also rocking, and you have dampers that will provide the uh, damping, and the uh, cables will provide the recentering of uh, the structural elements okay, back in their initial position. So you have damping and self-centering. The system is resilient. Okay? There is no damage in the timber. Okay? So you're saying that perhaps the damper will need to be uh, replaced, but that's, okay, that's a possibility. But I'm not going to cover this. We've covered this a lot. I want to move on to what is being done in Auckland. Okay, so that's the damper that is being used. Um, and so the connection between the damper and the timber has to be designed elastically. And more than likely, what will govern that, the design of that connection will be the amount of slip. Okay? It has to be a very connection. Okay, the stiffer possible to have all the movement concentrated in the damper. So one of the um, concepts that is being developed here is the pinching free connector. Okay, and one of my PhD students is working on this right now. So the objective of the PFC is to keep the fastening deformed or undeformed, always in contact with the compressed fibers. So we have, going back to the example before, where the bolt was always kept at the same vertical height. In this case, the bolt is following the compressed fibers at every subsequent cycle. Every new cycle is the original connection. So we're changing the way behaviors, so we're, we don't have this gap. So that is a rendering of the concept. There is a ratcheting uh, mechanism that connects, in this case, let's say it's a shear wall, hold down, anchor bolt, and connectors that are uh, bolts that are going into your shear wall that will compress the timber but this device will keep the plate and the bolts always in contact with the compressed fibers. So that was the first PFC in, in the lab, okay, just to uh, show you what it is. And we did some experimental validation. So a traditional connection, just normal anchor bolt, six of the small um, bolts, in this case, the PFCs to the right, uh, in this case, four smaller uh, bolts, and in this one, two big and stronger bolt in the connector. So the differences was that in the typical bracket, pinching would occur, the bolts would yield, the timber would crush. For the number two, the bolts would yield, the timber would crush, there would be no pinching. That's the, okay, the uh, idea of the PFC. And in the, the last one, 
no benching, no bolt yielding. Okay, and you'll see why we uh, are using this one. So the loading regime was incremental uh, cycles in terms of displacement. Okay, very simple. And for the traditional connection, six M10 grade 4.8 volts, we have deformation in our fasteners. Okay, and because they're slender fasteners, not all the fibers are crushed. So if you have reverse cycling, okay, you get a bit of um, a bit of gap, but also residual stiffness in your connection. So you get that type of load displacement relationship every cycle, okay, as to go and once you have lots of deformation, then that site that last cycle, okay, was had to compensate for about seven millimeter of gap, and then the, there would be contact with the between the bolt, the bolts and the fibers, and then the stiffness would increase, take up some load, compress more fibers, and then release. Okay? That's your typical connection when there's pinching. The other one where the 4M10 grade 8.8 uh, .8 volts were used with the PFC. So at this point, too much deformation and there was a secondary uh, failure. Okay, lots of compressed fibers, okay, big gap. But the low deformation of that connection is that you get uptake of load up to that level, it comes down. Then the next cycle picks up from this and then keeps up and then comes down. Picks up again and it just keeps on going every time that you have a new cycle. So very high stiffness of your connection. There is a portion of ramping because it's still small fasteners that are yielding, so until these bolts are adopting their um, equilibrium uh, fastener uh, shape, okay? This is, at that point, okay, you reach mode one resistance, okay? It will not deform anymore, okay? So there's pure embedment throughout the thickness of your fastener. So this is now mode one controlling, okay? So, and that's the plateau that we're seeing. Okay, so every new cycle, okay, is a new, is a new connection. And putting few fasteners, okay, so two very strong fasteners, in this case, uh, M16, okay? No deformation in the fastener. Very, very stiff right from the start. Okay. And this is the type of behavior we have. So elastoplastic type of behavior, every new connection. So, <clears throat> what does that mean for energy absorption? A traditional connection with a lot of small fasteners Okay, we have, remember that we have two cycles for every displacement. The first one, there's uptake of the fibers. The second one, no difference. Okay, first cycle, nothing different. First cycle, almost nothing different. Okay, but in the PFC connection, okay, every cycle, there is uptake of energy absorption. was for, uh, for two, four, and eight millimeter displacements. Okay. So it gives you uh, the potential to go to, to use mode one, okay? So mode one becomes your fuse and allow a much lower overstrength factor. This embedment resistance is very predictable in your timber. Your ductility is uh, possible, high ductility is possible for your discrete connection, okay? 
and it's just a matter of uh, controlling the secondary uh, failures. So possibility of using fewer large fasteners and the connection retains its stiffness following a seismic event. Okay. Now, there are some drawbacks. You need to avoid brittle failures by engaging more timber. You can do this by putting the bolt higher up in your connection, away from the indices, or reinforcing with screws. Okay? Avoid the shear type or shear related um, failures in the wood. It's not a damage avoidance system. There's a limit of amount of crushing, the amount of crushing that you can get, you know, in the volume of wood that you've used. So following an earthquake and their aftershock, okay, you probably have to go back and fill it up, fill up the, the gaps again, reposition the structure or the connection back to its original position. Okay? So it's not perfect in per se for timber, but it's very close. So, some of the application, okay, CLT uh, shear walls or eventually, okay, beam column connections where you'd be able to develop enough, okay, crushing in, to develop your moment connection. The next one is the resilient slip friction joint. So that's being researched at the University of Auckland and uh, Auckland University of Technology. So, the way it works, okay, so we're going away from connecting the, uh, or developing the fuse in the timber connection. Traditional timber connections will have crushing. They will not be resilient following the earthquake. The PFC will have crushing. It will be resilient following the earthquake. Eventually, okay, it will need to be repaired because there is a limit to the amount of damage. If you want a connection that is truly resilient and no damage in the timber, you cannot use timber crushing. Okay? It's not a damage avoidance. So, so in this case, okay, it's a fuse and the middle plates are connected to your lateral load resisting system. It moves from the earthquake. The cap plates move in and out. You compress the discs and following the earthquake, the restoring force provided by the compressed discs provide, okay, bring the fuse back to its original position. So it's a friction damper that self-centers. The behavior is geometrically nonlinear. Okay? It will give you a nonlinear behavior. There's no damage in the fuse. Okay? So there's no damage up to its ultimate resistance. There's no need for timber crushing. Okay? So if you want a resilient structure, no timber crushing. Okay, you can use that. So the way it works, the middle plates have slotted holes. The bolts, okay, only work in tension. They do not work in shear. There's enough gap between the bolts and the plate to give you five to six percent drift in your structure. Okay? Something else will be a problem by then. Using high strength bolts and disc springs. And that would be how it looked okay, in terms of fuse type behavior for a different application. The behavior, the low slip behavior of the connection of that fuse is a flag shape. So you have an ultimate resistance. So up to this point, everything is behaving elastically. The F slip depends on the amount of pre-stress that you have, okay, in your bolt and in your uh, disc springs. Okay. So that can be tuned depending on the serviceability limits of the structure. Okay. And there's a restoring force 
and a residual force. Okay? So any ultimate displacement can be obtained. Any of this can be tuned to whatever is required, depending on the application. So some of the application, okay, one of them was is rocking shear walls or columns. Okay, so you use this as the hold down. Okay? And the pins allow for uh, rotation of the units when the wall is rocking. Okay. The other one is where you have okay, a tension compression brace okay, in a hinder brace frame. So in this case, the units will provide resistance in compression and also in tension. You have BRBs for steel. The RV will have to be replaced. This will not have to be replaced. So, and this, uh, in the middle, you have a telescopic type of arrangement, bracket, that prevents the buckling, the overall buckling of the, the brace in the frame. So the first application was by Ashkan Hashimi. Okay, in uh, this CLT rocking shear wall. So hold downs, the units are attached at the corners to provide hold downs. And Ashkan had developed a rocking um, or a shear key, horizontal shear key, where the holes were profiled that would allow the CLT wall to rock. So the holes are kind of circular, okay, so they meant the bolts would always touch the outside edge of the holes, allowing pure rocking of the wall. And the tension from the hole down would, you know, the hole downs would take the tension, the shear key would take the horizontal load. Okay, and that was a six by two, six meters high by two meter uh, wide column. And that was the uh, hysteresis behavior low deformation behavior, so purely flag shape response, okay, and no damage at the end, okay? And this is the, uh, those are the videos of the wall rocking and the fuse RSFJ opening up, okay, at the corners. This is being used this concept is being used or is being detailed for some of the projects right now in uh, Canada and in Christchurch. Okay, and I'll show you more examples. The next one, and that's uh, fresh from last week, a test that was done at AUT. So our timber diagonal with the units at the top. And to load the diagonal, a steel column is used and the actuator connected to the strong wall. But you have your units here, okay? Uh, and this test, okay, it was uh, 50 millimeter displacement in compression, 50 millimeter in tension. So it's plus or minus 50 millimeter. And allowance for a bit more for a secondary fuse. But, okay, you get the idea, you have a connection, you have a diagonal, it's a pin-pin, and the allowance for taking some load in compression and in tension, okay, there will be an initial stiffness in your diagonal, okay, because until the F-slip of the fuse is overcome, there is no movement between the steel plates. And this is the uh, video of the test. Okay, so this is when it was loaded in tension. Okay, but you see the diagonal moving, and that's the hysteresis behavior of the uh, diagonal. So in this case, uh, each unit can take 200 kilonewtons in tension and compression. So the diagonal could take 
400 trillion that we have to do okay, at the end. Okay, but you have a diagonal that is very stiff until the next slip, and then starts to open up. Okay? Changes the period of your structure, your phase shear goes down or doesn't go up, okay, and your structure is for the lab now, where are they being used? First uh, application is the new Nelson Airport Terminal. An LVL structure, you go there, it's a truly iconic building, very well detailed, very, very stunning building. So some of the columns have them at the bottom and at six meters. The units have a resistance of a thousand kilonewtons in tension only with a 20 millimeter um, ultimate displacement. And they provide up to 850 kilonewton meters as a plastic in. Okay, so these columns are doubly reticulated. Okay, so a bit tricky to understand, but once you go into the building, you see that the, so the building is rectangular. Uh, those columns are along the spine of the building, and the columns on the outside there and on the other here, the, the columns are oriented towards the, the inside, and the units are only at the bottom. Along the spine, along the columns on the spine, the units are in the bottom, and at six meters. So your columns are doubly reticulated, so you can move at the bottom, and move at six meters so that it prevents damage from the top of your column. Your roof does not deform, okay, when the column wants to move sideways. Your column is rigid, okay, it can stay vertical. So it protects the top, okay? So very, very uh, nice building. So that was, that was the first application. The second one, Okay, as the lower hut is the um, Hut Valley Health Hub in Lower Hut. So in this case, the timber application is on the diagonals. So you have those K braces. And in this case, the diagonals uh, were of three different uh, capacities. Uh, 600, 600, 400, and uh, 300 kilonewtons. Always two units. So this is a 600 kilonewton capacity. Two units at 300 each. Okay, and you see the um, the pin at the bottom and top. Okay, you still have to detail the other connections to provide okay deformation compatibility of your system. That is important. Okay, movement is allowed in those fuses, but detailing of the other connections is also becoming very important in this case. The units were also used in rocking concrete shear walls in this case. That building is an IL-4 building. So meant to stay open at the rear end. So that's the uh, brace being installed. The advantage is that now your fuse hits uh, outside of your timber. Your timber structure can be designed using higher ductility values. It's fully resilient, so there's no damage to your timber structure. And because there's no damage, it's quite predictable. Your overstrength factor can be as low as 1.5 in this case. Okay, so now we're able to design discrete connections for timber structure, okay. quite predictable. So in terms of ductility, um, it can be two, it can be three, okay? Uh, it can be anything if you control your serviceability limits and there's a lot of displacement pot potential in these connections. 
But the thing to remember in this case is that deformation compatibility in the rest of your structure, your gravity system, okay, is, needs to be taken into account. So in summary, okay, we have new developments, the resilient slip friction joint and the pinching free connection for timber connection. And these allow higher ductility factors. And this is going to be important for growth in the scope of the timber projects that we're seeing right now. Lower overstrength factors will be possible because the ductility will be predictable. And the apl applications would be for all types of structures, residential and non-residential. Thank you very much. Plane capacity. Okay, so in the um, in the rocking shear walls um, or rocking columns, in, in this case of uh, the Nelson Airport, uh, we were asked to demonstrate uh, in plane and out of plane, and also the combined in plane and out of plane, up to plus or minus three percent. Okay, so we were able to demonstrate this. Um, what I did not show, but I can provide information, is that for the rocking units, we provide, we have a pin at the bottom, and we also have a swivel bearing, okay? A swivel bearing uh, allows plus or minus 7% drift out of plane. So plenty of uh, capacity to, uh, for the rocking shear wall or column to go out of plane. For the other applications, your timber, your brace frame, you, we are assuming that your brace frame is all going to be moving out of plane as one unit, and that your your brace will stay more or less into one one plane in, in the out of plane direction. Okay. Yeah. Hold on for just a second. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure, is it um, the connection itself, is it all made out of steel, or is it like part Yeah, of the, the connection is, is steel. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah, of fire, yeah. because I was just trying to see if you had like the fire design of the connection. Is it, is it going to be similar to the design with the transmission on the pole? Uh, so obviously you, that fuse gives you the the ductility in your timber structure. The connection between the fuse and your timber needs to be over, you know, capacity design. Okay. Okay. So you apply a, your 1.5 factor, okay, to connect to the rest of the timber. So in, in the Nelson, Nelson Airport terminal, uh, that connection here, uh, so these were 1,000. The connection capacity here was 1,600. Yeah. 
there are possibility of um, sort of typical detail. And if you go, if you look at what the, um, the researchers in Canterbury have done, okay, they came up with a detail where there's a pin in the, say, the gravity system between your, so you'd have your rocking shear wall, and on each side of it, there'd be a beam, or beam leap on both sides of them. There'd be a pin, and into your rocking shear wall, you would have a vertical slot. <coughs> when your rocking wall is moving, okay, that slot, okay, will allow the wall to rock, will not induce vertical movement of your gravity frame, okay, although your, your frame is gonna go down a bit because its parallelogram just go down, you know, with the lateral movement. But yeah, if you look at the, what's in the literature, right now it's possible, okay, to have compatible deformation in plane of the rocking shear wall and also out of plane. It's, it's not an issue, okay? It's, and they've, I think they've tried it uh, at MIT in Nelson, and I'm pretty sure in the Kaikura building, uh, the um, civic building in Kaikura, okay? That resisted the earthquake, uh, the, the 2016 earthquake. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it, there's a detail that will allow deformation compatibility. Between the diaphragm and the rock and shear wall. Yeah. So, last question. The PFC? provide, uh, there is a, a grease component that is provided between the, the, uh, uh, the steel, and that grease right now has a, a durability of 45 years, or demonstrated durability of 45 years. Okay. Um, in five years' time, I hope to be able to tell you that the durability is good for 50 years. Yes. 